So welcome to our next Biol 3465 Tropical Forest Ecology and Use Lecture uh, continuing on the themes of biotic interactions in tropical rainforests. We're taking a look now at plant animal grazing and predation on plants uh, in a tropical rainforest. Now it's important to know about these things because if you are managing your tropical rainforest you need to know whether plants and animals are going to get along well together or not. You need to understand how pests can become a problem in your tropical rainforest if you're farming say one species and so on. So this lecture will give you a background into how tropical rainforest ecosystems work with respect to these biotic plant-animal interactions with regards to grazing and predation. So if you have any sort of pest attack um, on your plants in a tropical rainforest, this is the background uh, behind which um, that interaction uh, operates under. So we'll take a look at plants and herbivory. We'll take a look at uh, whether herbivory is a big problem for plants and so on and so forth. We'll take a look at plant secondary compounds or the chemicals in the plants which help defend the plants against herbivory and predation. And we'll take a look at some of the other non-chemical plant defences and finally we'll take a look at a couple of uh, examples of these plant insect interactions in a tropical rainforest. But first of all, plants and herbivory. So plants are static, plants can't move, they can't run away, that makes them easy to find and describe and so we know um, we've got a pretty good idea of how many species there are but it also makes them very vulnerable to predation and to grazing. So these plants can't run away from an animal predator. These animal predators or grazers can move around the forest looking for these plants and the plants can't get away. Despite this, in tropical rainforests, much of the primary productivity is not actually eaten by animals. A figure here, the biomass of the animals is usually about 0.0002% of the plant biomass on average in a tropical rainforest. So if you remember back to your first year, second year ecology, you will remember with energy flow through trophic systems, it's usually around 1 to 10% of biomass uh, transferred between the different trophic levels. So if you have if you have 10 tons of primary and uh, 10 tons of primary producers plants, then you would at the most have about one percent, one ton of animal, or down to maybe a uh, uh, hundred grams of animals. But here, in a tropical rainforest, it's usually much lower than 1% the biomass of animals compared to the plant biomass. So, obviously the animals are not eating the plants uh, as much as they would in other ecosystems. So, somehow the plants are escaping from that herbivory and predation. So if we look, do an analysis of the diets of animals in a tropical rainforest, about half of those animals ate dead vegetation only. So they would only eat vegetation material which the plant no longer had any use for. And only 7% of animals in a tropical forest ate live plant material exclusively. So about 43 percent of animals in a tropical rainforest would eat 
some degree of dead and live animal, um, plant material in a tropical rainforest and much of that would be material which the plants allowed the animals to have in the form of inducement such as fruits and so on which we'll talk about afterwards. So the vast majority of um, plant material uh, is allowed to live and go through its natural cycle and die naturally without being uh, grazed or predated by animals. So there's a vast resource out there which is not being used by animals. The reason for this lack of utilization of an abundant resource is mainly, well, it's a combination of things um, which includes chemical warfare and physical or mechanical warfare. And it's thought that the chemical warfare is probably the most important reason why animals don't overutilize plant primary productivity or the plant biomass. This chemical warfare uh, comes in the form of what is known as plant secondary compounds. Now plant secondary compounds are complex carbohydrate molecules which build up in the bodies of the plants but seem to lack any sort of me metabolic purpose. Quite often they seem to be the byproducts or the waste of some metabolic process but in themselves they don't seem to have any particular use. In some ways these compounds may be seen as storage compounds for the carbon, the hydrogen and other and oxygen and other um, and other compounds which can be attached to these molecules, nutrients and so on. And in most particularly in the energy stored in the bonds between these carbons and hydrogens. So they may be storage compounds. But upon examination, many of these plant secondary compounds are actually what is known as bioactive. In other words, they will interact with the metabolism of animals and microbes which encounter them or eat them. So these compounds can be toxic to a greater or lesser degree to animal herbivores and microbial uh, herbivores. So in a way they protect the body of the plant by being a chemical shield against consumption. So if a plant or uh, plant or microbe consumes part of a plant, sorry, if an animal or a microbe consumes part of a plant, it will ingest these secondary compounds. And quite often these secondary compounds are toxic to the animal or the microbe. And the animal or the microbe will become sick. And in the worst case scenario, the animal or the, the microbe will actually die because they've taken too much of these toxic compounds. So where do these secondary compounds come from? Well they probably originated as chemical waste or byproducts of uh, metabolic act, um, reactions which were critical to the functioning of a plant and although they, they probably didn't do anything at the time they accumulated in the body of the plants to a greater or lesser degree and at the very least they would have been selectively neutral. In other words they wouldn't have disadvantaged the plant in any way uh, in competition between itself and, it, and individuals of the same species. So these secondary compounds didn't take away enough of the nutrients and the carbohydrates and the energy needed for the plant to compete 
against its neighbors so it could compete just as efficiently and still build up this secondary compound. So it was selectively neutral, at least initially. These secondary compounds, if they did confer a selectively negative effect on the plant in which they, would, they were found, they would be known as, or well, we would know them as a mutation and the individuals which hold which had that mutation would be removed from the population because they could not compete with individuals of the same species but these secondary compounds probably at least initially were selectively neutral they did not affect the competitive ability of the plants they arose in and where did they come from well as i said before mutations. Mutations would build up within the uh, individuals of a particular population as UV light and so on does its job and maybe errors in the uh, reproduction and the replication of DNA and cells within individuals would all cause changes in the genetic code and therefore changes in the metabolism, behavior, etc. of individuals within the population. These mutations would occur very rarely and many of these mutations would be selectively negative and so would be immediately weeded out of the population. But some of them will be selectively neutral and they would be incorporated into the, ge the genetic makeup of the population. So the individuals which hold these mutations or these secondary compounds, these new secondary compounds, would come to persist in the population. Later on, they may confer actually a selectively positive uh, effect to the individuals which they are occurring. So they may confer increased fitness on the individuals which they occur in. Now the way in which they may move from being selectively neutral to selectively positive is if the environment changes. And we're talking about herbivores here, so if the environment has changed with the introduction of a new herbivore, and that herbivore is affected by that secondary compound, and it cannot eat that secondary compound, it will leave the individuals of the plant with that secondary compound. It won't be able to eat them. And so those individuals will be benefited by that secondary compound and therefore they will be um, have a selectively positive um, effect which means that they will be able to complete compete better with other individuals of the same species who don't have this secondary compound and therefore they will increase their numbers in the population Okay, so these secondary compounds, was that my first okay? I hope it wasn't. I hope it was. So these secondary compounds would increase in uh, frequency within the population if they confer increased fitness. And the herbivore, uh, which is trying to prey upon the plant would be deflected away. It would not be able to eat that plant again until the herbivore changes. And sometimes these herbivores, particularly insects or microbes with relatively high uh, generation turnover time, so they have lots of generations very quickly 
they are able to evolve different behaviors, physiologies, and different morphologies which can deal with these chemical defenses, particularly the physiologies when we're talking about chemical defenses. So our herbivore will change as well as the plant changing and so a kind of chemical arms race will develop with the plant changing and deflecting the herbivore then the herbivore changing to get around the chemical barrier and then the plant will change once again maybe another secondary compound which was hidden away in the leaf just sitting there selectively neutral and it that individuals with that new chemical will be able to deflect the new herbivore. So plant secondary compounds build up through mutations and these mutations increase over time as they accumulate if they are selectively neutral. So if you look at a plant in a tropical rainforest you will generally find that they have a large number of secondary compounds Many of those secondary compounds are selectively neutral. They seem to have no purpose. They're just sitting there. But in the future, if a herbivore comes along which finds that secondary compound poisonous, that secondary con compound may become useful to the plant. So these plants existing for long periods of time with the mutations building up within them and therefore the secondary compounds building up within them are able to defeat these herbivores using these mutations which have developed over a long period of time. And we can use these secondary compounds as well. So humans would often use these secondary compounds in medicine and in recreation because these secondary compounds are bioactive they do interfere with our metabolism or change our meta metabolism but if we take them in small enough doses small enough amounts they won't poison us they won't kill us and those secondary compounds may actually uh, cure us they may be able to kill any sort of parasite or um, um, virus or bacteria which is uh, preying upon us. It may kill that bug before it affects us or it kills us. And in that way, secondary compounds can be medicines. But generally, if you take a large enough amount of a secondary compound, it will probably kill you. So for instance, nicotine, that alkalide, is a very toxic compound. If you take too much nicotine, it will kill you. So I mentioned alkalides there, alkaloids. Alkaloids are a very prominent group of plant secondary compounds. So they're a type of molecule which includes the cocaines, the morphines, caffeine, nicotine, and uh, cannabinoids. Cannab cannabidol. 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 These alkaloids are generally bitter tasting and they really can severely interfere with animal metabolic functions particularly mammal metabolic functions particularly vertebrate metabolic functions and they are used as defense mechanisms in many plant groups so we get nicotine from the leaves of the tobacco plant which is a species in the family Solanaceae. The, the family Solanaceae is renowned for having 
large numbers of alkaloids in their leaves. So when chemical companies are doing prospecting for promising secondary compounds which can be bioactive, they quite often focus in on any new solanaceae which they can find because they know that they quite often will have large numbers of alkaloids. So humans actually go after these plant secondary compounds through bioprospecting. Chemical companies or drug companies will go into a tropical rainforest and harvest every plant they can get their hands on and they can reliably identify. They will take uh, the parts of the, those plants back to the lab and they will use certain standard extraction methods and they will take the solutions which they extract, the chemicals which they extract through maybe alcohol extraction, water extraction or um, acid or base extractions and they will test those extractions for any sort of bioactive uh, properties quite often just by dropping solutions of these ex um, extractions into standard um, micro uh, cultures and seeing whether these extractions kill the micro cultures or not. So this sort of broad scale screen screening is known as bioprospecting and it's how humans can track down and locate bioactive plant secondary compounds and not only plants but also animal secondary compounds which may be used in medicines for humans. Another type of plant secondary compound are the phenolics and tannins. They occur in the leaves of temperate and tropical plant species. Uh, tannins are the teas which we drink. They protect against herbivory and microbial attack in these leaves. These tannins and phenolics um, are particularly found on low nutrient soils. The plants want to hang on to the leaves because the leaves represent a fairly large store of nutrients and um, primary productivity and they don't want to lose them to secondary sorry to herbivores because it takes a lot of effort to get those nutrients in a low nutrient environment so they try to protect their leaves against herbivores with phenolics and tannins what happens when these leaves die, complete their life cycle and die and fall off the tree is that these phenolics and tannins will leach into the soil. They will kill off a lot of microbes which may compete for plant complete compete for nutrients with plant roots. And then the phenolics and tannins will go into the groundwater and into the streams. And those streams as a result will be stained dark a black tea color in the water. So this is the origin of these black water rivers and black water creeks which are found in Guyana. You've probably heard about. This black water is the result of phenolics and tannins from the leaves of plants growing on these very low nutrient white sand forests which are found in the northern part of Guyana on the Guyana Shield. So phenolics and tannins occur in the leaves of these trees to protect them so that they don't get so they don't lose their nutrients to herbivores. You can also see an example of that in Trinidad on the Aripo Savannas. The Aripo Savannas is effectively a white sand forest as well and there's a creek which comes off the Aripo savannas and that is known as the Black Creek and it's known as the Black Creek because it has black water in it and when you see it mixing the Black Creek mixing with the water 
from the Aripo River, the contrast between the types of water is, is stark, particularly because the Aripo River has a gravel washing plant which puts a lot of suspended sediments into the river a little bit further upstream. Another example of this on a larger scale is the Rio Negro where it meets the River Amazon. Now the River Amazon arises from the Andes Mountains where there are still a lot of glaciers in higher altitudes and a lot of erosion of rocks so the Amazon River will carry a lot of suspended sediments so the water in the Amazon River tends to be quite milky or cloudy it's quite turbid there's a lot of suspended sediments in it now the Black or the Rio Negro River arises from the same Guyanan shield mainly in Venezuela this Guyana Shield is an ancient uh, pre-Cambrian piece of basement rock which has been above water since the pre-Cambrian and has been weathered and the nutrients depleted from it since then. So it's a very low nutrient uh, area and the forest growing on the, um, on the uh, Guyana Shield have to cope with low nutrients so they have a lot of these phenolics and tannins and that is the reason why the Rio Negro is turned black and when it meets the Amazon River at Manaus the two big rivers flow side by side for several kilometers and you can see the waters from the Rio Negro which are clear and black and the waters from the Amazon which are white and milky and cloudy and they don't mix for several kilometers after they've converged and it's strange to see the uh, two very distinct waters flowing along uh, alongside of each other uh, go on the internet you'll see some of them so there are alkaloids, phenolics and tannins and there are other many other types of secondary compounds as well in many different types of plants. As I said the um, Solanaceae tends to be one of the big families for uh, alkaloid secondary compounds. Now chemical defenses is not the only defenses that plants have plants can also have physical defenses and one of the most effective physical defenses it, it is thought are cellulose and lignin so fibers and leaf toughness really do discourage herbivory as well it's quite difficult for large uh, herbivores like mammals or vertebrates to digest cellulose and lignin and in fact mammals cannot digest cellulose and lignin by themselves they need to enlist the help of a microbe okay which lives in their guts which will break down the cellulose and lignin for them once they've chewed up and swallowed the leaves of these plants even so, the amount of time and the amount of energy which is gotten out of these fibers, these lignin and cellulose, tends to be very low. So these animals will tend to have to survive on very low uh, energy levels. So much so that they tend to be very slow moving with very slow metabolisms and because brains are one of the organs of the body of these mammals these vertebrates which demand a lot of energy the brains of these animals tends to be quite small so the koalas and the sloths are very slow moving and they have a reputation 
of not being particularly smart either. So fibers, lignin and cellulose will discourage herbivory. Latex is another way in which plants can deter herbivory, particularly the smaller animals like the insects. And let's face it, the insects will tend to have the highest biomass and the largest numbers of species in a tropical rainforest. Latex works by if the insect chews on a leaf or a plant part, its mouth parts will be flooded with a sticky latex. And that sticky latex will gum up the chewing mandibles of these insects and they won't be able to feed any more. So latex is also a physical defense against herbivores for plants. Plants would also use hairs and spines to deter herbivores of all sizes. Hairs on leaves can prevent caterpillars and small uh, herbivores gaining access to the flesh of the leaf itself. So they're held away from the leaf blade. And if those hairs have sharp spines on them, those spines can claw and rip at the, un the soft underbellies of these um, herbivores. Larger spines on trunks of trees and on branches will also deter larger herbivores going up against the tree or climbing the tree to access the leaves. So plants will use these physical defenses to defend their um, biomass against herbivorous attack. Okay, now I'm going to I think I've given you the general gist of um, plant-animal interactions in tropical rainforests and how it tends to be weighted in favor of the plants due to their defense mechanisms, both chemical and physical. I want to talk a little bit about some examples now. I want to talk about plants and insects. Now plants and insects are quite interesting in tropical rainforests, mainly because insects do evolve fairly quickly so because they have very short generation times and so they can rapidly circumvent the defenses of a plant. So it seems like quite a few of the secondary uh, compounds may be in ineffective in preventing herbivory. It also seems that toxicity doesn't need to be lethal to be effective quite often just slowing the animal down or making it uncomfortable will give the animal, in this case the insect, the message to move on, to find another plant to eat. But plants will continually evolve new chemicals or more probably they have many chemicals or many compounds in their leaves already which can be called upon to defend the species against uh, herbivorous attack. So much so that these animals will need, particularly the small ones, the insects, will need to specialize in a particular species of plant so they can evolve the physiology that can deal with those defense mechanisms. So if it's in the best interest of the animal, if they can get around that defense, then they exclusively have access to this plant as a food source. So animals which evolve or mutate a method to get around these um, defense mechanisms of plants will be favored and they will really increase in number and quite often they will become new species so that they can utilize the resources offered by these 
particular plant species. Unfortunately, that plant species quite often will have another secondary compound up its sleeve, and so the animal will have to evolve again to overcome this next one. And in doing so, it gets further and further away from the original species it once was. So these animals are quite often driven to specialize in particular species of plants so they can specialize in circumventing the defenses of this plant. By the same token, the animal, sorry, the plant will also specialize in defending itself against this particular uh, animal. And so in this way, a process of coevolution occurs where the plant influences the animal, in this case an insect, and the insect influences the plant at the same time. And so both change or evolve over time with this selective pressure which they inflict on one another. And we'll talk more about coevolution in the next lecture. One set of animals, besides humans, in a forest can afford to be generalist. They can afford to get around the chemical defenses, not by specializing, but by putting these plant defenses through a filter. And that filter, filter is a fungus. And I am talking about leaf cutter ants or bajaks. They are able to be generalists because when they cut their piece of leaf and carry it back to their nest, they will feed it to a fungus culture. Much like a farmer feeds nutrients to his crops, or manure to his crops. So the ants will be able to eat the fungus which are kept alive by the material bought, uh, the leaf material bought by the ants to the fungal colonies. So these leaf cutter ants are able to use a wide range of plants and be generalist because their fungus digests the food and provides them with a food which they can utilize, which is the same no matter what leaves they feed it. This fungus is able to survive all these secondary compounds. So leafcutter ants are a very efficient predator or herbivore. Through the um, mediation of this fungus. And because of that they can form very large colonies which weigh uh, considerable amounts in biomass and they are one of the few species which are able to build up large biomasses in a tropical forest and that is because they can circumvent the chemical defenses of the plants. Another characteristic um, plant predator or plant herbivore, in this case plant predator interaction are the brucid beetles. Brucid beetles are coleopteran beetles, but they are a group which is highly specialized to the seeds of the legume family of plants. Legumes are um, plants which produce their seeds in a pod, and they are able to produce a fairly large number of seeds. And these seeds represent a very tasty food supply for coleopteran beetles. And brucid beetles have specialized in accessing the nutrients represented by the seeds. But the plants don't take this predation of their seeds lying down. They produce secondary compounds in their seeds to deter the brucid beetles and the brucid beetles 
evolve physiological mechanisms to get around that. The legumes uh, evolve behavioral mod modifications, for instance, developing explosive dehiscence that flings the seed away from beetle eggs which may have been lay laid on a pod. And the beetles will respond by another behavioral change, maybe by drilling the seeds through the, the um, tester um, through to the tester of the seeds so that the eggs aren't actually on the pods they are directly on the seeds so even if the seeds are flung away the eggs will go with them the plants will develop flaky pods so if seeds are laid on the surface of the plod, pod quite often the seeds will flake off these legumes will delay seed development so they will keep their seeds as small as possible for as long as possible and then in the last week before uh, dispersal of the seeds the seeds will rapidly fill with nutrients and grow and then be dispersed very quickly to try and minimize the amount of time that these brucid beetles have to locate and predate the seeds. So the brucid beetles will attack the seeds and the plants will respond with mechanisms both chemical and physical to try and protect their seeds and the beetle will then evolve to get around those defenses and this happens quite efficiently such that one species of beetle is quite often found on one species of legume. So in other words we have specialization of the beetle on the legume species and that is a result of the legume species specializing itself in its defense of the beetles towards the beetles. Another classic interaction is between heliconid butterflies and passionflower vines. Now you all know passionflower vines. Those is a picture of a passion, a flower of a passionflower, a passionflower vine. They grow quite often around fences in suburban areas and so on. Uh, you'll recognize the flower, but the leaves can be a great variety of shape. And form. So this is a passion flower vine with a very different shape leaf to the classic three lobed leaf that we quite often see. And there are many weird and wonderful shapes for the leaves of the passion flower vines. Even though the flowers will be more or less very similar, the leaves are quite often very different. And the reason for that is because these butterflies, the heliconid butterflies, which lay the eggs for their caterpillars on the leaves of these passion flower vines. So when the eggs hatch out, the grubs will graze on the leaves of these passion flower vines. And one of the ways in which the heliconid butterfly can find the passion, um, passion vine, which its grubs have the physiological mechanisms to defeat the secondary compound is through the shape of the leaves. So these butterflies have a good pattern recognition system which allows them to go to the appropriate um, species of passionflower vine. So these passionflower vines are constantly changing the shape of their leaves as individuals which may have a uh, slightly different leaf shape through some mutation or something uh, which allows them to capture more photosynthetic material than their neighbors because their neighbors leaves have been eaten by a caterpillar they will persist in the ecosystem and spread that leaf shape in the ecosystem in the population of that particular vine Okay, so again, the passion flower vines 
drive the changes in behavior and physiology of the heliconid butterflies, which themselves drive changes in the size and the shape of the leaves of these passion flower vines to try and help them avoid herbivory. So there you go, the interactions between plants and animals in a tropical forest. It's a story of chemical defenses, chemical warfare, mechanical warfare, and a story of specialization. And I probably need to emphasize that specialization of a herbivore in a particular plant species is very common throughout a tropical rainforest. So much so that if you have a plantation in a tropical area of a single species of tree, if the herbivore predator is present in the country where you plant this tree, quite often that tree will be wiped out because the specialist predator will be able to breed up and totally defoliate that particular tree. So specialization, mutations, secondary compounds, chemical warfare and physical defenses. These are the things which I want you to remember from this particular lecture. Okay, thank you very much.